In my previous series of videos, I raised the question, why do I wander around in the freezing cold in the city? I'm about to do that. It's my day off work, and I'm about to just start wandering through the streets of the city, through the parks, maybe down by the river, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, it's about, I think, 33 degrees below zero centigrade, and it's not very sunny out. Uh, and there's a wind, and a lot of people might think that's crazy stuff, because it's not comfortable, um, it's not what a lot of people would consider pleasant, being chilled and um, whipped by the freezing wind of the steppe, the prairie, is quite an experience. Um, I'm constantly awed by the ferocity of the weather around here. And as a sort of a history geek, I like to think about how certain peoples were affected by it. Uh, in other words, a lot of the conquerors that ended up being powerful people, uh, powerful peoples in Europe, uh, owed their um, military prowess to their uh, period of their history when they lived in the steppe and were hardened by life there. Uh, the Turks, the uh, Germans, the Hungarians, the Russians, um, various conquering peoples uh, were hardened by life in the steppe. The Huns, the Mongols are the classic example. Um, and it is a harsh environment, but I like going out into that. Um, and one can force oneself out into that kind of weather for the very same reason uh, that, um, or perhaps the, for the to, to pursue the same effect as was visited upon the Mongols. You want to harden yourself. Um, you want to push yourself because you get a feeling that you have improved yourself by pushing yourself hard out into that, <clears throat> by inuring yourself to cold and um, a certain sort of hopelessness that can overtake you in the, in the, the harshness of the, the northern winter. Um, if you can harden yourself to that, you're a pretty tough cookie. Um, that's one reason why people would go out in there. Um, I mentioned seasonal affective disorder, or cabin fever. If you stay inside too long, some people at least go crazy. I mentioned that the um, the native people here seem to have evolved a mental uh, defense mechanism against that. They have the capacity to be, you know, you just sit there and don't do anything. You don't need even a conversation to keep you going. Uh, you just live up here. Um, that's a generalization. Um, there are probably plenty of type A native people out there, but my experience with them is they're a lot more sort of internalized than we are. And I guess that comes of their history. This is they, they've been shaped by the land here more more so even than a lot of um, Canadians who were born and raised here, Caucasian Canadians like myself or any other immigrant group. These people belong to the land more than we do, and they've evolved certain uh, characteristics which enable them to deal with that, deal with things like cabin fever, um, with seasonal affective disorder. You just you don't really shut down, you just pull inward and you're okay with just sitting there because they might have had to have done that for months on end um, in nothing more than a shelter from the elements that's maybe the size of a small room and they might have you know, 10 or 15 people in there uh, say a, a teepee or something like that and they might have to live in each other's faces for five months and they learned how to do that without getting too disruptive or going crazy or whatever. And you might want to cultivate that. You might want to deal with seasonal affective disorder by forcing yourself out into the cold weather and getting your blood pumping and um, I guess the release of endorphins or things like that. And that's one reason to push yourself to do something unpleasant is you don't want a negative consequence in this case um, going uh, from being indoors too long. <coughs> uh, you want to cultivate that characteristic which allegedly the native Canadians have. Um, 
there's another way you can sort of come at that question, why do we do anything, why do I go out, or whatever. It's, it's justification. What do you want to go out there for? What, 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 what do you seek? Like, what, what's the benefit? Um, or, you know, there's the why could also be a request for justification. Um, I'm a reformed smoker, and I'm a reformed smoker of the worst kind. <laughs> I'm the sort of person that will think, you know, I have to suppress the urge to walk up to people that I know who smoke and snatch the cigarette out of their mouth. So what do you think you're doing? Do you know what? The, this is dangerous. This is one of the stupidest things you could do. You're destroying your health. Um, you're wasting money. You're giving the government all this money and big tobacco. And you're, it's just an all-around unjustifiable thing. It's just horrible. Um, but I know that I have these feelings, and I suppress them. Or at least I don't suppress them, I suppose, in as much as I just sort of say, okay, don't act on that feeling, Andy. You don't want to create problems for this person with this person. You want to continue to interact with them. And if I see a complete stranger smoking, I, all right, just let, let the guy give himself cancer. It's nothing to do with you. Because, again, that happens to reformed smokers. You get religion. You decide that, you know, in some ways, cigarettes are the devil itself. Now, philosophically speaking, or ethically speaking, if I get into a conversation, people say, what, do you, what are your opinions on tobacco usage? I'd say, well, it's none of my business. If the, you know, as long as it's not affecting me, I have, you know, who am I to tell somebody what to do or whatever? You know, uh, smoking a cigarette or a cigar or whatever, it's, okay, maybe it's not the healthiest thing to do, but it's none of my business. I have no no opinion on the matter. Um, but viscerally speaking, I want to go up and snatch the cigarette out of that guy's hand before he lights it and say, and stomp on it in front of him and say, don't do that, that's terrible. Because I've inserted that into here, that aversion to cigarettes. So in one sense, I believe that smoking is completely justifiable, um, morally and ethically speaking, because it's an individual choice and it's none of my business. In another sense, I have no tolerance for it whatsoever, but I force myself to tolerate it, or perhaps I don't force myself to tolerate it, but I, I keep myself from acting on my own intolerance um, of smoking, which I, I admittedly have. I am extremely, in a sense, intolerant of smoking. So it depends on how you're coming at that question of why, of justification even. Um, <clears throat> because... When you ask someone for justification of something, here's um, Mystic of the Sands' um, quote, and he's, he's encapsulated it perfectly, if you ask me. Why do we ever do anything? I've come to a sort of conclusion that fundamentally all justifications for any kind of action you can think of are a sham. But we have a list of socially approved justifications, or at least, quote-unquote, partly acceptable justifications, for a particular action uh, is on that list. We and others feel like we have just cause for X, Y, Z. But ultimately, everything is unjustified and unjustifiable. That, in essence, is what unfathomable concretely means. Okay, everything is unjustified and unjustifiable, which is, I, I can understand that. But what do you mean by that? Um, by unjustified and unjustifiable? In other words, you can't really make a moral case for doing things. I assume that's what Mystic meant when he said that. Um, yes, I agree. But if everything is unjustified and unjustifiable, that would imply that the requirement of justification is unjustified and unjustifiable. Because if someone is asking me to justify what I'm doing, in a sense, they're placing themselves in the role of judge. Because that's, you know, justifiable. Justice. How do you justify that? It's, you know, judge. You're judging somebody. You're evaluating their actions, um, whether good or bad. So I would counter that question, why are you doing that, with the honest and not sort of tennis racket kind of response, in what capacity are you asking me that? Who are you to ask me that? Um, how do I justify, for example, smoking a cigarette? I, I, or how would, <clears throat> if I were to ask someone who is smoking a cigarette, I would ask them, how do you justify smoking? Now, if they said, who are you to ask? I might get insulted and sort of say, what do you mean, who am I to ask? Well, the question, who do you think you are to ask me this, is a legitimate question. 
In what capacity am I approaching that person asking for justification? Um, <clears throat> am I sort of, I've got all these reasons why they shouldn't do it, and they have to overcome my objections to cigarette smoking. Um, otherwise, they have no justification for smoking a cigarette, because I've got all the reasons why they shouldn't do it. Well, I'm, <clears throat> in a sense, I'm approaching that, that person from a position of authority. I'm saying that I've got justifiable reasons for you to refrain from doing that. Okay, now that's an assumption that's built into my question. I know that you shouldn't be smoking. That is the bedrock upon which my entire approach to that person who is smoking is based upon. I'm coming at that person in the assumption that they shouldn't be smoking. And they have to, from that starting point, show me that they are justified in smoking. Who am I to ask them that? And I don't mean that to say, you know, the, the usual, who the hell do you think you are to do that? No, I think that it's a legitimate question. How am I phrasing the entire interaction when I require justification from someone? I ask somebody, why are you smoking? I've automatically framed the question in such a way that justification is assumed necessary. How do I justify that? How does justification or the requirement for justification justify itself? <laughs> um, if everything is unjustified and unjustifiable, then the requirement for justification is unjustified as well. Um, I did a long-winded thing a week or so ago about Anakantavada, and Anakantavada ultimately has to be applied to itself. The request for justification ultimately has to be applied to itself. <laughs>